so we studied about um, acetic acid derivatives. Does anyone remember the examples? Under non-selective NSAIDs, we studied about acetic acid derivatives like intermethacin. Ketorolac. Yes. Ketorolac yes. Okay. So there is one more drug also there in that list. We call it as salindac. Okay. So the question was, salindac has got a structure similar to what? Remember, it is indomethacin. Oh, this sometimes usually comes in chemistry as well. So I don't know. Just keep an eye on this. It might come in paper one as well. Okay. So salindac that also comes under the acetic acid derivatives. So now you can remember one more example under that. The question asked was that salindac has got a structure similar to which drug? So the answer was indomethacin, which was given in the option. So you remember salindac has got an I. So remember intermethacin in that way. In this here, in this here, like that you remember, okay? Then regarding the NSAIDs like silicoxib, it is metabolized by which CYP? CYP2, CYP2 C9. C9. We studied C9. that, yeah? So any NSAIDs, any question related with the metabolism, remember about CYP2C9. NSAIDs like diclofenac, aspirin, ibuprofen, they can cause lithium toxicity. Have you heard of this thing? So we studied hyponatremia can cause lithium toxicity. That is one thing you have to remember. But NSAIDs, when it is given along with lithium, it actually reduces the renal clearance of lithium. Thereby, it causes lithium toxicity. I repeat again. NSAIDs, when it is given along with lithium, it reduces the renal clearance of lithium. Thereby, it causes lithium toxicity. So you have to remember two things, important things associated with lithium. One is hyponatremia causes lithium toxicity. Okay. So what we will tell the patient, whether to increase the salt intake or decrease the salt intake. Increase the salt increase. intake. Increase the salt intake, right? Because hyponatremia causes lithium toxicity. Second point you have to remember, NSAIDs when it is given along with lithium, it actually reduces the renal clearance of lithium, thereby it causes lithium toxicity. Important, keep that in your mind, okay? That's the second thing you have to remember. The third thing is NSAID for tenosynovitis, it's actually the inflammation of the fluid-filled synovium within the tendon sheath. You just remember this thing, okay? No need to study the explanation. It's actually the inflammation that is happening to the synovium uh, in the tendon. We call it as a tenosynovitis. Okay, itis means inflammation. The drug used is NSAIDs. Especially you will see ibuprofen in the option. So always go with that option for the treatment for tenosynovitis. So that is a new information for you, right? So remember, salindac has got a structure similar to that of intermethacin. Both comes under acetic acid derivative. Remember, salindac, it has got in. So remember, in, intermethacin, like that you remember. Rem uh, regarding the NSAIDs, remember, the metabolized by CYP2C9. That is also an important question. NSAIDs, remember, when it is given along with lithium, it actually reduces the renal clearance of lithium. Thereby, it causes lithium toxicity. Also remember, hyponatremia causes lithium toxicity. So we will advise the patients to increase the salt intake, okay? NS8, that is the one which we are using for the treatment of tenosynovitis. Remember, we can give ibuprofen or any other NS8, okay? So that's the key point so far. Coming to the aspirin toxicity. So aspirin, what's the other name? It is otherwise called as acetyl salicylic acid. Okay, so as it is acetyl salicylic acid, you know what we have to give as an antidote. We have to give an alkaline medium. So first option is always activated charcoal as it has the property of adsorb all the toxins onto its surface. We can also give the bicarbonate, IV bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate because it alkalinizes the urine to increase the secretion because it is acidic in nature. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid, okay? 
In children's aspirin toxicity, sodium bicarbonate alkalinizes the urine to is the excretion. So the question uh, they have asked once was that in uh, which of the following cannot be used in children with aspirin toxicity? Answer was EDTA. EDTA, have you heard? Ethylene diamine tetracetic acid or something? EDTA? Yes. Chelating yes. agent. Yes, so EDTA, that is a chelating agent we don't use for uh, aspirin toxicity. Even if it is children, elderly, whatever it is. Remember, we are either using activated charcoal or we will be using sodium bicarbonate. That will help to alkalinize the urine to increase the excretion as well. Then, aspirin's active metabolite is salicylic acid. I think you will study that in chemistry again. Aspirin toxicity in children causes... Ray syndrome, yes. Aspirin toxicity symptoms mainly the most is tinnitus. Very, very important. So remember, aspirin high doses that can lead to tinnitus. Aspirin in children, if it is given followed by a viral infection, it causes Ray syndrome. Remember, aspirin, it has got an active metabolite called salicylic acid, okay? We call it as acetyl salicylic acid. Remember, we use IV sodium bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate, or we can use the activated charcoal in terms of toxicity. Okay. Remember the NS8 for the tenosynovitis. We can use any of them. Mostly we prefer ibuprofen. You can find ibuprofen in the options always. NS8, when it is given along with lithium, it reduces the renal clearance and increases its toxicity, okay? Remember, all NSAIDs, they are metabolized by CYP2C9. Remember, salindac has got a structure similar to that of indomethacin. Salin, in is there, and also indomethacin, in is there. Likewise, you can remember. Clear? Yes, Next is regarding the mechanism. So we studied about the analgesic, antipyretic, anti-inflammatory actions and all, right? So the one thing which I want to tell you is we studied the mechanism in such a way that it inhibits an enzyme called cyclooxygenase enzyme. Thereby, it inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandins. These prostaglandins are actually responsible for initiating fever, pain, and inflammation. Is that correct? We already studied. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. But in terms of platelet action, there is a small difference. Okay. So I'll tell you that. So if you see here, it is a non selective NSA. It prevents the synthesis of prostaglandin by inhibiting COX 1 and COX 2. But remember, aspirin anti platelet mechanism of action, it is by same by inhibiting COX 1 and COX 2. Thereby, it inhibits or prevents the synthesis of TXA2, thromboxane A2. Remember, thromboxane, that is a factor responsible for platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation, you know. Okay, so remember, TXA2, that is a factor. That is the one which actually responsible for uh, clubbing all the platelets together for clotting. Okay, so what they will do is, it's mechanism of action by Inhibiting COX-1 and COX-2, thereby it inhibits TXA2, that is the thromboxane A2. So remember, if you get any question related with the aspirin's antiplatelet mechanism of action, remember, they inhibit COX-1 and COX-2, thereby they prevent the synthesis of TXA2, not the prostaglandin. Prostaglandin that is associated with the pain, inflammation, and fever. Whereas TXA2, that is the inducer for the platelet aggregation. So by inhibiting TXA2, it has got the anti-platelet action. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If suppose if the question comes, you should be able to know. TXA2 means, remember, it is something related with the clotting process. Okay. Prostaglandin, that is means something related with the pain, inflammation and fever. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Aspirin should not be taken with coumarins, that is the our warfarin, because it decreases the platelet aggregation, can increase the bleeding risk. Okay.